tonight's January meeting. I'm going to start out by giving a little introduction to what is Montgomery for All um, and what are we going to be talking about tonight. Uh, so I guess to introduce myself, my name is Jane Lyons. I am the Maryland Advocacy Manager for the Coalition for Smarter Growth. So um, some updates. Uh, Montgomery for All, as I'll be mentioning in a minute, is a um, is a grassroots group that the Coalition for Smarter Growth has been organizing um, to advocate around Thrive Montgomery 2050, which is Montgomery County's general plan update. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's all right. I will go more into what that is later. But a few updates. Right now, uh, the planning board is doing work sessions on Thrive 2050, and they're going well. Uh, so I've been monitoring those, and if you want to watch the recordings of their conversations, those are online as well. They've been revising each uh, chapter to be more concise and clear uh, before they have a conversation about it. And so things have changed a little bit, but not too much. Um, and then the other update uh, is the Missing Middle Public Hearing on Thursday, February 11th at 7.30. Uh, the wait list or the speakers list has filled up so you can now sign up to be on the wait list, uh, but we really hope that people will send in written testimony before then to make your voices heard about missing middle housing. Uh, and after tonight's meeting, you will be uh, maybe not an expert, but you will know a whole lot more about missing middle housing. So tonight I'm going to give a little bit of background and then we'll have a presentation from Lisa Gavoni, uh, who will talk a little bit about missing middle in Montgomery County. And then from Eli Spivak, who will talk about missing middle housing in Portland, Oregon. So we're really covering from coast to coast here tonight. After that, uh, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, about the content that was in each of those presentations for a few minutes after each of the presentations. And then we'll have a broader question and answer session after, after that. So about Montgomery for All, as I mentioned, we're a, <coughs> excuse me, a grassroots, I just ate some spicy Thai food, so <laughs> uh, excuse my uh, throat. Uh, Montgomery for All is a grassroots group organized by the Coalition for Smarter Growth, and we're advocating for a general plan that paves the way for a more equitable, prosperous, and sustainable future. We have a platform with 10 goals for Thrive 2050, which is the general plan. Uh, and one of those goals is to allow for more housing options, which is why we're talking about missing middle housing tonight. But uh, we're not just focused on that. We also want to see protections for vulnerable communities. We want equitable, safe access to amenities, a world-class transit network, and so much more. A little bit about the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Uh, we're a regional advocacy nonprofit. Um, and so we focus on the entirety of the DC region. I'm our Maryland person, and I focus mostly on Montgomery County. And we touch housing, transit, and land use issues. And so the ways that the belt environment is connected. Uh, and we have a vision for a region that has a network of walkable, inclusive, sustainable, transit-oriented communities. In Montgomery County, we've advocated for bus rapid transit, the Purple Line, and the housing moratorium, bus ring dwelling units, uh, and a lot more, but those are some of the headlines. So what is the general plan? It looks at the entire county, not just one community or neighborhood of Montgomery County to determine the blueprint for how and where we will grow over the next 30 years, uh, 30 years, but maybe more. It requires implementation. It doesn't change zoning or any policies on its own, but it will guide the planning department's work program and the county council's policy agenda on issues related to housing, land use and transportation, environmental protection uh, for the foreseeable future for the next 30 years until it's really implemented. And why do we need a new general plan? Uh, because how we've grown over the past several decades has exacerbated segregation. We live in a very segregated county as well as climate change. So we need to set the county on a new course to create neighborhoods that are mixed income, diverse, sustainable, and prosperous. So a very brief history about Montgomery County's general plan. Uh, the first general plan was completed in 1964 and was updated in 1969. There hasn't been a comprehensive update since then in 1969. There was a refinement of the goals and objectives in 1993. But really, we haven't had a comprehensive look at the blueprint for how we grow since 1969. And um, as I'm sure a lot of you have been in the county maybe since then, maybe you're around for the first general plan being written. 
uh, and a lot has changed since then, so it's time for a new one. This was a little bit about uh, how they envisioned the county to grow. This was in the 1993, 1993 update. So they were envisioning a, the urban ring around the Beltway, the I-270 corridor with the corridor cities of Rockville, Gaithersburg, Germantown, Clarksburg, um, the suburban communities, uh, the residential wedge, and then of course, agricultural wedge, which is the agricultural reserve. Um, so we've kept to this pattern pretty well, but maybe not as well as was originally envisioned. Um, and for the reasons I've stated already, there are plenty of reasons that this needs to be updated for the 21st century. And so uh, that new general plan, as I mentioned, is called Thrive Montgomery 2050, or just Thrive, Thrive 2050. And it's looking at everything through three lenses, economic health, community equity, and environmental resilience. It has these eight issue areas. Um, and those, I think those might be changing a little bit with the new revision, um, but essentially these are those eight areas. Um, and you can see affordability is included in that. This idea of complete communities where you can uh, walk or bike to most daily needs within 15 minutes, um, connectedness, safe and efficient travel, a lot of really big and important issues here. So this is a timeline for uh, what is happening, how the general plan is getting put together. Uh, we are well into the process. Really, this process started in 2019. We're in 2021 now, so it's been nearly two years. Maybe it's been exactly two years at this point. Um, and right now, as I mentioned, we're in the planning board work sessions from now until March 2021. After that, it will go to a, the plan will go to a vote at the planning board, and then it will go through a similar process at the county council. So there'll be another public hearing at the county council, county council work sessions, and then the summer, June, we're not exactly sure, uh, but sometime this summer, likely the county council vote. So I want to introduce now um, our two speakers for tonight. We have uh, the housing policy coordinator for Montgomery County, uh, and that is Lisa Gavoni. She is with the Montgomery County Planning Department and leads on issues related to housing. Um, and I'm very excited to hear from her uh, about all of the great research that she does with the planning department related to Montgomery County. Um, and then we also have Eli Spivak, and I believe I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Spivak, Spivak? Spivak, yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, and he is a person who wears a lot of hats, it seems, and has, has done a lot. Uh, he is an affordable housing developer um, in Oregon, um, co-founded the group Portland for Everyone, which was definitely one of the inspirations for Montgomery for All, so thank you for that. Um, and he's going to talk about the, um, the Portland Residential Infill Project, which was one of the things that Portland for, All, Portland for Everyone advocated for. Uh, related to missing middle housing. Uh, and now he is the chair of the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission. So thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Uh, by the number of participants who registered and who are here, uh, this is a conversation that is of great interest in Montgomery County. Um, and we're all really excited to, to learn from you um, and learn about how we can make missing middle housing something that works to solve some of the challenges that we're facing in Montgomery County. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Lisa. Thanks, Jane. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Okay, yes. great. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, Jane. Like she said, my name is Lisa Gavoni, and I'm the Housing Policy Corner Coordinator for the Planning Department. And I'm happy to be here tonight to talk about one of my favorite subjects and something that I've been talking about a lot lately, which is missing middle housing. So first, what is missing middle housing? Um, missing middle housing generally refers to a range of building types that are compatible and form and scale and construction type with single family homes, but they include multiple units. Um, we're typically thinking about two to four story, multi-unit clustered housing. Um, the most common forms are townhouses, duplexes, triplexes, small apartment buildings with less than 20 units and ADUs. 
Um, and one question that, you know, we can are continually asked and probably like one of the most common questions is like, does this exist already in Montgomery County? And the answer is yes. And we actually have a lot of missing mental housing in Montgomery County. Um, missing mental housing was common in the pre-World War II area, era, but it's in lot, and we've seen in a lot of older homes, but it's largely disappeared with um, recent and new construction trends um, when we're seeing a lot of mid to high rise buildings and new single family detached units. So approximately 17% of our housing stock, we could, could be called missing middle, um, having two to 19 units. And it might not be obvious from the outside that these missing middle that they, these are missing middle or they have multiple units. And one hint that I've learned from a lot of field visits when I do a lot of uh, parcel file cleanup is that you can look at the number of mailboxes and that's how you can, it's a good way to, to tell. Um, every picture in this slideshow is actually a, a missing middle in Montgomery County. So you'll see that's uh, common throughout the county, like places like East Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, we have it in Chevy Chase. Kentlands and King Farm. And we also see a lot of it with ADUs um, that are, we see in a lot of our single family neighborhoods. So why is missing middle housing important? Um, one of the biggest reasons it's important is because Montgomery County's communities have diverse needs in terms of housing. That includes affordability, the size of the housing and the type of housing. Missing middle housing is also a great way to increase access to home ownership. The units are typically smaller in size than a new single family detached unit and their smaller size can help them make them more affordable. One example that I always use is it's not a missing middle product, but it has a smaller size is the Octave Condo Building, which was an adaptive reuse project in downtown Silver Spring. Their unit sizes average from a little bit under 500 square feet to about 800. And because of that smaller size, most of them sold for under 300,000 and about 80% of them went to first time home buyers that put little to nothing down. Um, and I, I know this is a controversial term because I know some people hate it, but I actually really like the term gentle density. I think that's a really great way of describing and normalizing missing middle. And part of it is it, that we need this gentle density because it allows the county to increase its housing supply to keep up with demand. We haven't done a great job in the recent years of keeping up with demand and we are pushing a lot of people out and new people can't afford to live here. So it's a really great way to increase our supply. It also has environmental benefits, allowing more density near employment centers and transit and reducing BMT. And finally, and what I think is one of the most important things is building missing middle is an important step in addressing past inequities and housing choice. Uh, we know a lot, I'm sure everyone in this room knows about redlining, but we are starting to recognize the deep disparities that were created from the legacy of single family zoning and that includes in Montgomery County. So another question that we're constantly being asked is, is this affordable housing? And the answer is it's not income restricted affordable housing. It's market rate housing that will generally be more affordable to do its size, like I said, but it's not in any income restricted program. I think this is you know, a really important part because this is something we get pushed back a lot on is that if it's not affordable housing, it's not worth being built. Well, I think that this county has an affordable housing crisis, but it also has an attainable housing crisis and anything that we do that can increase our supply, increase access to home ownership, and generally allow more people to partake in the housing market is a good, is a good thing. Um, and you know, like many other jurisdictions, especially recently, we are only building you know, large single family expensive town, uh, single family detached homes, townhouses, our mid or high rise buildings, and we need to start diversifying our housing stock. Um, the average single family home in Montgomery County is actually getting bigger, while the average family size is getting smaller. So we have a little bit of not being able to meet the needs. So what, and the next question is that we hear a lot about is why do we need these zoning changes to build missing middle? Why can't we just build it as build it right now? And generally speaking, many of the existing missing middle housing structures could not be built under the standards of the current single family zones that generally own zones like R60 or 90 or probably the two most common zones for single family homes. I do wanna say that many of the single family zones in Montgomery County do allow for some types of missing middle housing, namely duplexes and triplexes, but they have to go through additional requirements to build these missing middle homes and single family zones. And this includes additional process, which includes a 
discretionary planning department review to achieve these planning departments. And anytime you're adding on process, you're adding on money. Um, there's also affordable housing requirements to achieve this additional building type, even if you're building under 20 units, which is typically the threshold for inclusionary zoning, the MPDU program. And as affordable as the housing planner, I love affordable housing, but I also know that it is the most expensive thing that we ask for in the development review process. And so adding on additional requirements that we don't have for the teardown rebuild process makes it more expensive, makes it more expensive to build. There's also usable area requirements that are generally um, about three to five acres for your R16 or R90 zone, which is you know, impossible to find down county in our transit accessible neighborhoods. And finally, even at their densest, um, many of the single family zones are significantly less dense than what you need to make missing middle work. At its densest, R60 is around nine units per acre, um, which that includes like a full bonus density for building MPDUs. And the typical missing middle product that we found in our study is about 10 to 20 units per acre. So I wanna talk, spend most of the time talking about some missing middle initiatives that we have ongoing. So in 2018, we released the missing middle study and this was our kind of our first foray into missing middle at the planning department. As a study, it does not require adoption, but it gave us some really great ideas of additional strategies that we could help our form or guide future action. We also completed you know, previous master plans, the Veers Mill Corridor Master Plan, Ashton, the Forest Glen Montgomery Hills sector plan, where while we didn't have the zoning to make missing middle work, we took uh, the least dense mixed use zone and kind of made it work by using guiding language. Um, but we realized quickly that if we want this to be any kind of regular thing that we do, that we really need to look at changes to our zoning code to make it work. And of course, Thrive Montgomery, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I think Jane did a great job. I think we're probably going to hire her soon because she does an amazing job introducing the general plan and selling it for us. Um, and finally, um, council member Jumando introduced ZTA 2007. I'll mention it briefly and I have a slide about it, but I, we can't say much because the planning board has not yet taking action on it. I do have a 45 page staff report posted on Montgomery Planning Board today, if you are interested in knowing what planning staff thinks about it. Um, and I do, I can't get through a presentation that I do without sharing some like really fun data that I'm working on. And so for part of the Silver Spring plan, we were tasked to look at the adjacent communities for the opportunity of building missing middle. And so, my coworker Todd and I are working on like a missing middle market study. We call it the mini missing market study or OOMS, which is like a, a really great acronym. And so as part of this, we're doing some analysis on like the housing stock, zoning analysis, market analysis of like what would it take to get this built. And we're having a lot of interviews with industry professionals who have been so helpful and gracious with their time to help us learn about what it would take to build this. So first I wanna show the median sales price, which is depressing to millennials like myself who would love to buy a house. So in zip code 29010, 292910 is a zip code that serves Silver Spring. So since 2000, prices have risen over 140%. And then I looked up, you know, 2020 stats to see how they're doing the pandemic. Um, and not surprisingly, we had a very constrained for sale market in 2019. In 2020, it got significantly worse. The average detached home price rose by nearly like almost $40,000 to over $700,000 in 2020. And then I looked at the, the price range and this is Montgomery County and about 65% of homes sold in Montgomery County were sold for over $400,000. And average days on market is a measure that we use to look at the health of the for sale market. And it shows that in 2019, the average day on days on market was about 30 days, which is pretty significantly showing that we have a strained market um, and 32 days for the county. But in 2020, it didn't get any better. It's actually dropped to 24 days, which is pretty significantly showing that we have a pretty for, uh, constrained for sale market. <clears throat> and recognizing that missing middle, if built, it will call in what we are we see we call the teardown rebuild market, 
where you have small builders that generally come in, take a home, tear down and build it much bigger. We're seeing that while it's not something that's as common as it is in the western side of the county in Silver Spring, we are definitely still seeing it and we're seeing it increase in regularity. And we're looking, and so we looked at the gross floor area of these homes that were small starter homes for about 1,100 square feet. They're being torn down and rebuilt as McMansions for over 3,000 square feet. And what does that mean for the price? So the sales price before the teardown was about half a million dollars and it skyrocketed to over a million dollars after their rebuild. Um, so prices increased by about 115%. And so Jane talked a lot about Thrive Montgomery. And I, I do wanna mention that I think it's important that we set up actions and policies in Thrive Montgomery that, that ensure that exclusively single family zoning is not a develop, it's not a barrier to development in neighborhoods near employment centers and transit. And so the plan includes a lot of policies and actions that support the production of different types of housing and transiting. And this includes our existing single family zones. We think this is an important step, like I said, for equity. We think it's important for housing choice. And we really see that Thrive Montgomery County is one of the first steps that we're taking to really look at diversifying our housing stock. And so I will briefly mention ZTA 2007. Um, the ZTA 2007 will be at the planning board next Thursday. And there is a public hearing <coughs> on February 11th. Um, ZTA 2007 was introduced independently by council member Jawando. Um, it is a zoning text amendment. So it's independent of the Thrive Montgomery process and the Silver Spring process. But one of the, what ZTA 2007 is, it was allow owners of R60 zone property within a mile of Metro Rail stations to build duplexes, townhouses, and multifamily, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> multifamily structure within the, the same standards of the R60 zone. And this is what they did in Minneapolis too. So I think it's a great opportunity and kind of our first foray into looking what like implementation would look like for um, missing middle and you know we're excited to work with the planning staff is excited to work with the county on implementation of missing middle and so I think that's it for my presentation uh, I'll be happy to take questions and I also put my email and my phone number up there if anyone would like to <coughs> send me email information after Thank you so much, Lisa. That was that was a great presentation. You were able to cover a lot and as you are well known for share some excellent data. Uh, you can always count on Lisa to provide that data. Um, I have a few questions that people shared in the chat. Um, I guess the I'll, I'll start I'll, I'll go backwards a little bit. Uh, so at the end, you said CTA, which is zoning text amendment. Can you explain what a zoning text amendment is? Sure, and what I can do is we have a great ZTA explainer on our website that kind of walks through the process. So a zoning text amendment, uh, our ZTA, as I love my jargon and acronyms, um, what it does is it changes the text in the zoning code. So compared to a master plan, master plans um, result in a sectional map amendment and that changes the underlying zone of your property. So you could go from R60 to CRT. What a zoning tax amendment does is it changes what those things mean. So it could change the standards of the R60 zone and what it means to be zone R60. <laughs> Does that, if, if that explains it. And so then can you also explain what is the difference between R60, R90? What are, what are these R numbers? Sure, so R60, R90, R200, those are in RE1, RE2, those are what we call our single family zones. That means it's primary use is a single family detached home. Um, there may be instances, like I said, where you can build different types of housing in these zones, but generally the primary use is a single family home. Um, and then we have this, or probably the other most common zone that we talk a lot about is the CR zone. That's the mixed use zone, the commercial residential zone where you're gonna see your high density residential being built. And how prevalent is our, how, 
how prevalent is our 60 and other single family zones near the metro stations in Montgomery County? Sure, so that's a great, that's a great question. So um, R60 is actually pretty common. Um, the CR zones are actually, you would think, you know, it's very common, but it's actually only about 3% of the land in the county. Whereas single family zones like R60, R90 are the vast majority. Um, part of that is because we also use zones like R60 to build things like churches and schools. So you do have other uses in these zones, but I believe, you know, one, at least one third of the land in the county is zoned for single family detached uses. I know that I'm always, I was surprised because uh, I'm originally from Calvert County. Uh, and so, Me too, uh, as you know. Right, yes, we're, we're both from Calvert County, Montgomery County transplants. And so as I got to know Montgomery County, walking around um, and walking, you know, just a 10 minute walk from mm -hmm. some of the major metro stations in the county and suddenly being surrounded by gigantic houses that are well over a million dollars <laughs> um, and not having anything else in those neighborhoods that are so close to such high quality transit was, was just really surprising to me as somebody, as an outsider coming into the county uh, uh, several years in, in college when I first became familiar with the, the metro system in the region. Um, let's see, so uh, a few clarification questions about the data. Um, it, you showed the pie chart at the beginning, the units and structure pie chart. Is that based on the total number of buildings or the total number of units, housing units in the county? You are. It's okay if you want to share your yes. screen again too. <laughs> so everybody else knows which chart we're talking about. Sure. Sure. I think it was, yeah, looking at the so it's based on the units in, in the structure. So it's number of units. Okay. And then another question was when you're talking about housing prices later in the presentation, are those inflation adjusted? You can tell that we're a highly educated county when we're asking about that. <laughs> I believe they are. Yes, I will double check, but we have we do run it through the inflation calculator when we create charts like that. Okay. Um, a few more questions. Um, so does and so right now, uh, for people putting questions in the chat, we want to keep the questions focused on this presentation, because uh, we'll have a, a broader Q&A after we have Eli's presentation as well. Um, but we have a few more minutes for this, so I'll, I'll, I'll run through some of these questions for you, Lisa. Uh, Michelle asks, does the Z, does ETA 2007 allow for setbacks to be moved within the R60 zones? No, so the setbacks would stay the same as you were, if you were building a new single family detached unit. So it's the same setbacks. Great, this is like rapid fire. So Marilyn asks, is there, <laughs> some, mis <laughs> is there some missing middle housing number or percentage that we hope for? Uh, she, she asks like, for example, up to 50% of the neighborhood. I don't think there's like a percentage of the neighborhood. I think that we hope that it comes organically. I think, you know, one of the things is in the staff report I posted for ZGA 2007 is, you know, Minneapolis did this and they got three permits the next year for triplexes. So we don't expect if ZTA 2007 were to be, it were to pass that we're going to see a lot of tra neighborhood transformation. I think that we expect, like I said, to be an organic gradual thing. Um, if you like your single family home, we hope that you can keep it. We don't expect, we're not going to come and take away your house, which I think is a really important question. So I think it also depends on, you know, where you are in the county. There are a lot of places that I could see more transformation than others where we're already seeing a lot of price pressure. Um, places, I think, neighborhoods around Bethesda, for example, I think that the master plan set up some really high heights and there's a lot of our 60 neighborhoods that could I think see turnover if those homes go for sale. And I think another important thing to mention is the, the regional housing targets that have been set, mm -hmm. uh, that the pipeline for housing and development in Montgomery County is not enough to meet those housing goals. And uh, part of the goal for those housing targets that were set by the Council of Governments and accepted by Montgomery County was that 75% of that should be um, near uh, high capacity transit 
and 75% of that should be affordable. Um, and that those are going to be difficult targets to hit, um, but really important in order to keep our housing supply up with the demand to live in, live in Montgomery County, to live in the DC region. That's a great point. One of the things that we did for the general plan is a capacity analysis where we looked at all of the zoning and we took a market look at what do we think is likely to come out. And we think that we have the potential with the zoning on the ground for about 65,000 units, but not all of it is where we want it to be. I think that's what our takeaway is, is there wasn't as much as near transit as we thought there would be, especially in our BRT corridors. So that's something that we'll be looking at um, as upcoming work program items. Uh, this is a question that um, I've, I've seen people ask a lot in these conversations and I think is important. Tracy asks, is there a preference that missing middle homes are rentals or purchased? And just how, do, how does that normally work? Are they normally rentals or are they condos? How, how does that often happen? Sure, so I'm sure that we'll see like a mix of rental versus condo. Um, and the way that I can say the way that the ZTA 2007 is set up is that if they were ownership, they would have to be structured as a condominium because it does not allow subdivision because the lots would then not meet the standards of the of the zone. So if I and I think that's fine. I think condominium structures are fine. I think that one of the great things about Missing Middle is that it can create attainable home ownership opportunities. So that's my personal preference um, because I think that's a real miss and a real big thing that we're looking at in Thrive. But I could see it, you know, either one. Um, okay, so I think we should probably, I, there are a lot of questions, which I, I expected. <laughs> um, so we will hopefully get back to some of these later. Um, but for now, I think we should probably transition to Eli's presentation. So uh, thank you so much, Lisa, and I'll hand it over to you, Eli. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for including me in this. It's kind of like virtually going back to where I grew up. I um, I spent my early years of life 600 feet from Montgomery County in Friendship Heights. I went to school with Greenacre School in Montgomery County um, and toured the Red Line before it opened to age myself right now. Um, I live in Portland, Oregon though, and thanks for the, the introduction. I, um, I also am a general contractor and a developer, so I, I get to build this kind of housing type and see how it works for, for first time home buyers a lot of the time. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen if I can get Lisa to release it. Or maybe I can. Let's see. Yeah, Lisa, you might have to unshare your screen first. Oh. Let's see. Oh, no, she may have stepped away. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> well, oh, she I'll unshared it. There over. we go. Okay, great. Um, let me share my screen here. I will say, um, Lisa, you mentioned about the ability to subdivide the property to um, make it available to um, individual home buyers. And there's actually a bill going through our legislative session right now to force every city in Oregon to do exactly that, to allow for partitions of middle middle, middle housing properties. Um, that's, a, that's what a state rolling land use can, can do. I'm gonna share my screen here. And so I, I know Portland zoning code quite well. Um, Oregon has a different system from you. And so there's sort of a state and local relationship, but I'm gonna focus on Portland, I think, um, and share some of the images from here, but um, I'd love to see the images you've already have, so I'm not gonna to add too many to the mix. So we'll call this reintroducing, because as you know, it's been around a long time, petite, discreet, and affordable homes for today's smaller households. Um, because as you know, over almost two thirds of households now are one or two people, and average new homes are over 2,500 square feet in most, most places. So let me see if I can, oh, here we go. Um, that's where I grew up in a missing middle house, row house in Military Road in DC. And um, we'd be remiss not to share this illustration from Dan Prolek at Opticus um, Consulting where he sort of shows a visual of different range of housing types. And um, you, you've seen most housing getting built nowadays is single family detached homes because production builders know how to do it. And four plus story apartments are mixed use because production builders, developers know how to do that. And they don't do much in between. The financing stacked against it. Um, and, but there's a lot of um, historic housing of that site that's still around and a lot of demand for it nowadays. Um, I love looking at historic precedents. Um, actually, a couple of these are from where you're part of the country. You probably know Washington Grove is a little cottage cluster. Um, 
in along the Mark Line, um, row houses in DC. And then more from out west, you got the tiny house um, on wheels coming back, uh, the boarding house bringing that back and the accessory dwelling unit in the bottom right. That's where Thomas Jefferson lived while they were building Monticello. That's what you used to do. You build a small house and then you build a big house later on. Um, and then pop culture has examples too. Can't resist showing that Fonz lived in an ADU. Um, Sesame Street's about the best example of middle housing I've seen, um, including Oscar living in a little ADU on the front porch, which is not allowed in most zoning codes. Um, and Melrose Place, um, the shared housing situation. Um, so Portland, where I'm from, um, we get a lot of accolades for being progressive, but I want to show you this zoning map um, because it's got some similarities to yours. The yellow on this map is single family zoning. We now, we now call it single dwelling zones. Um, that's the vast majority of the land area that we have, including areas that are really close to great transit. Um, when I asked Jane in preparation for this presentation, um, the same question one of your um, guests asked, do you have our you know, 60 zoning in a half mile from your transit from the um, metro stops? And I was kind of amazed that you do. I mean, in many ways, um, the best thing to do would be to just read a lot of rezoning. Um, but politically, that's awfully hard to do. Um, so in some ways, these missing middle initiatives are a way of um, getting around rezoning to provide less expensive housing types in really um, wonderfully walkable locations. Um, and here's what we did in Portland. There was a lot of pressure. Um, I heard you get talking about really large homes getting built in Montgomery County. A lot of people were pissed off at how large people were building single family homes in their neighborhoods, including tearing down a smaller one to build the new one. And our zoning code was incredibly permissive. Um, it's only regulated by height and setback and a 50% building coverage. You could actually build like a 6,700 square foot house on a 5,000 square foot lot. And people weren't building that big, but they were getting close. They were getting 3,000, 4,000 square foot homes on these lots and they were, were unhappy. And at the same time, our group, Portland for Everyone, um, was pointing out, we just don't have households that big. And if we could put two on that same lot, that's another person who can live in a walkable neighborhood and share the land cost for a new home. Um, so part of the deal, the basic crux of the deal behind our residential info project, which is a terrible name, RIP, um, but it did get passed, is that we decreased the scale of homes. We decreased the floor area you're allowed. We actually redefined heights. You couldn't build as tall as you could build before. And at the same time, we increase the flexibility about what happens inside that envelope. And increasing the flexibility means one, two, or three houses on each lot, um, or up to six if there's an affordability component. So now you've got this, it becomes really a form-based code where you could have a house with two accessory dwellings, you could have a triplex on a corner. And here's a whole other suite of menus. You could have up to four units. Um, they could be townhouses, they could be stacked flats. Um, you just have a wide variety of options. And, um, and the idea was to make it fit in better with the neighborhood and have more flexibility. And we have no doubt that on many lots, people will still build a single family house. There's a lot of market for that. Even before zoning um, made that illegal in much, much of our city um, through single family zoning, still in, in, in neighborhoods where you could build a, uh, a courtyard apartment or a single family house, they still build lots of single family houses. We fully expect that to continue. Um, but we wanna have more options for people to, to choose from. And here's another little snippet we threw in, which is not in your proposed code, but I just wanna put it out there. This is kind of wonky, um, but if you just look at the R5 column, that's our 50 by 100 foot lot zoning um, that's pretty standard. We said, if you build a house, just a single family house, you can do 2,500 square feet of house. If you build a duplex or a house with an ADU, you have 3,000 square feet to play with. If you go to a threeplex, or, um, then you have 4,500, sorry, you have 3,500 square feet to play with. And if you want to go to four units, you still have 3,500 square feet to play with. So um, the idea is that as you build more units, you have a bigger entitlement for how large you can build. And I know you don't measure FAR, um, floor area ratio in your residential sector out there. It's much more common in commercial mixed use zones. But if you have some entitlement that you want to give a little bit more up to the builder in exchange for more homes, that provides a small incentive to actually use that provision. We started off our project thinking that these middle housing options would only be available within a quarter mile of transit or something like that. And I should say that back 20 plus years ago, we waived parking minimums within a quarter mile of transit. So we already had that out of the way. Um, over time, it became clear that if we did that, then um, we'd be excluding a lot of the city. And by decreasing the size of home, we didn't, um, we don't have any more development pressure to take down old homes. So we ended up covering pretty much the whole city to say you can build it anywhere. Any of the residential zones would be allowed for all these housing options. 
So I looked at your code a little bit. I wanted to share a couple of quick thoughts. One is that you've got big parking minimums. Um, and I know that's common. I know it's politically essential probably. And I also know that, especially once you get to the multiple homes on a lot, it blocks development because you don't have big enough scale to do structured parking. So you end up having parking competing with living space um, and you get garages lifting homes up off the street. So there's some tricks you could do. One is as you're, um, it's just to wave it within a certain distance off high frequency transit. Another is to allow tandem parking spaces to count towards your parking minimum requirements. And one idea that a city outside of Portland brilliantly did is to allow legal curb parking to count towards your parking minimum. So you can have a driveway that blocks curb parking, but any part of your frontage that doesn't have a driveway or a fire hydrant, parking spaces in that area can count towards your parking minimum requirement. Another thing to think about is how the middle housing code interacts with your accessory dwelling unit code. In some parts, and I noticed you guys just passed an update to your ADU code, which is great. Um, in many places, ADU regulations are like a nose under the tent for the end of single family zoning. Um, I can say that in California, it's a triplex state. Every city has to allow a detached accessory dwelling unit and what they call a junior ADU. Um, in Oregon now, you have to allow, in every city, you have to allow um, a wider range of, than that. Um, but sometimes they don't interact that well. If you allow a cottage cluster, um, of four detached homes and every house is allowed to have an ADU, you just double, you've gone to eight times your density and that may be more than you want to do. So make sure the codes work together well. Um, I love corner lots and um, we've had on the books for ages, the ability to do a duplex on every corner by right in the city. Um, Tigard, another city outside of Portland that allows quads by right. And it's a great place to put, that's where historically the larger houses were set. Um, it's easier to do parking on corners because there's just naturally street parking um, and and it's in a lot of corners out there. So that's a relatively politically um, palatable way of adding a few more homes. And then the last thing on this list is homeowner associations. Um, you probably can't control that because it's a state level factor, but you might find that many of the um, homes in these zones have overlying HOAs, private agreements that prohibit exactly the kind of housing types your zoning is going to allow. And it's worth inventorying to see how prevalent that is if you can. Um, there are certainly some newer, newer built communities where there's a lot of almost all large scale residential development done since the 60s or 70s has HOAs draped over them. And, um, and that can, can make all your zoning code work irrelevant. Um, and there are some states, um, Oregon and California have both um, made such regulations unenforceable um, by HOAs. Basically, you can't use private agreement to block middle housing. Um, you're not gonna do that at the local level, but at the state you could. Portland is a really big, complicated city. It took us seven years to get this done, um, our residential info project. Meanwhile, a small suburban, uh, a small city near Portland, Tigard, did it in nine, nine months. Um, and if you wanna look at a really simple, elegant code, um, they, they really, um, they're impressive. So I, I think that sometimes you can be nimble if you're not as big. Um, that might be something you could, um, you could just grab their documents and say, hey, this looks like a, a good approach. Um, it's pretty admirable what they've been able to do pretty quickly. I did one project with the state of Oregon um, based on looking for the most politically palatable infill options. And we've talked about some of these corner duplexes, um, ADUs, cottage clusters. That's where you, could, you allow basically twice as many homes along they're half the size. Um, but another one that people love is internal home conversions. And I don't know your rules on that, but um, you've got lots of alternative household configurations. You have large homes and there's a lot of antip antipathy towards people taking them down. If you can allow someone just to internally divide a house into five units, who cares how many, um, then that's a way of preserving the house and, and people won't, won't, will be happy that it wasn't taken down. Um, so the state mandates, I think I've mentioned, um, it, there's a lot of um, support the local and the state go together. But one thing I wanted to share about this, I'm not gonna delve into the details of Oregon land use, um, but at the city and the state level, um, the stories mattered a lot. And that's why it's so great that you've got an advocacy group there. Um, the, the planners, I'm sorry, the elected officials, there's always someone who's got a story and it's worth finding out who lived in a middle housing type when they were young, when they were trying to afford housing. Um, the people who did that are the ones who led the charge of the city of Portland and the state of Oregon to get these laws passed. Um, stories matter a lot. And I worked a lot with AARP around the country. Um, their members are great at telling the stories of how they can't afford, they don't want to take care of the larger house, but they want to stay in the neighborhood that they know and love. And they can share that and say why it's important for their electeds to give them the chance to do that with a smaller housing choice. 
Um, AERP was involved statewide to help get passed in Oregon. Um, and, and they've been involved in many cities across the country to legalize these less expensive housing tips. It works well for their members and also works well for young people just trying to get out of the house, give them the boot where they're gonna live, maybe one of these middle housing choices. I wanna pitch one more project that we just passed through in Portland, which is not exactly um, middle housing, but it's um, trying to get the zoning out of the way of some of the least expensive housing types that you could build. So these are shelters, which oftentimes require conditional use permits, um, tiny homes, um, getting rid of the definition of family. I know you've got some occupancy limits in your code. Trying to just say a house is a house, let's give people a chance to be creative in the myriad of housing, household configurations we have um, to have somewhere that they can afford to live and get some shelter. And I've made a couple of little notes here. I'll, I'll, I, part of my job, I think, is to help sort of stretch what you might consider doing. Um, I mentioned about parking. Um, the subdivision is, is a really important item. And for us, it's sort of a cleanup that we're doing in Oregon right now. Um, um, although it is possible to do condominium ownership for these housing types, it's, it's very expensive. It makes financing less easy for the buyers. And it's kind of weird to have hundreds of two unit condominiums showing up um, that have to be maintained in perpetuity. So I think that um, we're, we're doing a lot of work right now to let people drop property lines in between the homes in the middle of housing so there can't be fee simple ownership. Um, local government is not always enamored of that, but um, they're starting to budge. Um, the, the question is how expensive and how long the partition process is. Um, but there is a provision where you can just say that, you know, the lot minimum size um, goes with a higher density zone if you're doing a missing middle split. Um, I could share some code language on that if that's helpful. Um, and I think that I probably covered what I wanna cover. So I'm happy to answer questions um, and I'll leave it at that. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. You leave it up for one second or oh, <laughs> I can one leave it question up for one. Uh, about one of the slides. There was a question this back. Uh, about, can you define city for this slide? Although I'm not sure which slide they were referring to. Oh, okay. I think it was um, a few back. Um, let me see. Um, Who knows what I'm choosing? I don't know what I'm sharing with you now. Um, uh, that's the first, uh, the first title slide. I think they're referring to, if you could put in the chat, Amanda, which slide you were talking about. Okay. I think it's towards the end. Was this the, uh, the Oregon mandate? Yeah, I think it was after the Tigard one. Yeah, one? yeah, probably the Oregon yeah, one. So yeah, we defined yeah. um, the, the rules that the state passed required every city over, I, I hope I get this right, over 15,000, you have to allow duplex on every lot, every residential lot across zones. Um, if you're a larger city, um, and I think larger city is 50,000, but I'm not positive. I should have this remembered. So then you have to allow um, triplexes, duplexes on every lot. And you also have to allow triplexes, quadplexes, townhomes and cottage clusters on lots in areas of your city. It's not defined, but they just went through a, um, a rulemaking process and you have to cover most of your city with those options also. It's like 60 to 70%. So you can't just dodge it by saying you can do a cottage cluster here, you know, you really have to make them pretty broadly available. And no one's expecting this to be a, a short-term change. I think that was really well said by, by Lisa before. Um, this is a long-term play. I mean, development doesn't happen fast. Um, and a lot of times people are scared that the sky's gonna fall if you allow accessory dwellings, you allow these middle housing types. And I, it, it doesn't, I mean, it's slow. It's not easy to build this kind of housing. Um, those developers who got a niche out of doing single family detached home subdivisions, and those doing four plus story apartments, they still got the best financing out there. Um, it's just expanding the options for people who wanna do something a little smaller. I think that's a that's a great point. Uh, it's, it's something, as we often say in the housing world, nothing is a silver bullet, uh, but it's one tool in the toolbox that makes other tools more possible. Um, and it's also something that addresses kind of historical inequities. Uh, it was really exciting to see the Biden administration reintroduce the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Act. Um, and so this is of course connected to that broader, very long-term historical, uh, historical fight. Uh, so we had one other question related to your slides on the AARP slide. Michelle asked, do states typically have grants for building middle housing? Apparently that was mentioned on the AARP slide. Um, me this one here or yeah yeah i think that that was, that was the one okay someone's got better reading than me so 
AARP <laughs> has a, AARP has a program um, called their uh, these are called the SWAT team program or technical assistance, and they um, they have some grants to communities across the country to help fund initiatives, including zoning reform initiatives, um, and they also have grants that get communities technical assistance from folks like me and and Opticos who worked on the missing middle housing model um, and others um, around the the livable community section is a really innovative program within AARP um, and there are resources for local communities that want to get experts to help you know um, change the rules. Yes, AARP has done a, a ton of great work on smart growth. We're lucky to have um, somebody who works at AARP on our on Coalition for Smarter Growth board. Um, and yeah, they do wonderful work. I think the last question that's pretty specific to your presentation is does Portland allow for up to 20 units? I'm assuming that that question is referring to the, um, the residential infill project. You know, it doesn't. Um, so this is in our residential zones, which are you just get up to four units on a lot. Um, we do have plenty of other zones that let you get 20 units and, and more, um, but this really goes to um, the, I, I think it doesn't go as far as your code does. Um, so we, we, I think that we probably maybe have a little bit more of the multifamily zoning. It's blue on our map um, where we no longer count units anymore. We just base it on the floor area. It's, it's all about massing um, at this point. But we do, we do have a we have a twenty unit threshold where once you get over twenty units in a building, um, inclusionary housing applies. Um, I know you guys have that as well. Um, but no, it, it's it's a smaller scale than 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 you have. Uh, one question uh, related to the Portland story um, is that often one of the concerns that are is raised by um, by skeptical neighbors is about property taxes. Um, or about property values, uh, things like that is an often heard talking point. Uh, was that something that was also heard often in the fight in Portland? And how did you find ways to refute that? Is it claimed that it's gonna decrease people's property values or it's gonna, um, maybe I should understand the... Let's see, they say both uh, concerns about, oh, they say no, the opposite. Uh, Oh, oh, that it would increase right, property uh, values, making property taxes unaffordable. I see. Um, <laughs> we're not a good case study for that. In Oregon, we have a perverse property tax system. So once you have a house, they go up no more than 3% a year, no matter what. Um, so it's, you don't have, if you actually redevelop a house or add an accessory dwelling to it, then, then it gets stepped up, but you don't have a dynamic of um, houses going up with just what happens to the houses around them. But that said, I mean, these middle housing options don't really increase fundamental housing prices um, in their neighborhoods. And we've done a lot of economic modeling to show that um, because we decrease the size of how much you're allowed to build at the same time that we increase options, it does very, for the walks out there, it does almost nothing to the residual land value under the house. It doesn't um, end up increasing the value of the homes. It just increases the flexibility about what you can do within it at the same time, chewing down the size. Here's my son sitting coming to visit. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you for answering those questions. Um, I think those were the ones that were pretty specific to the Portland experience. Although I'm going to ask uh, about how did Portland for Everyone play into the advocacy for this? Uh, what were some of the effective strategies that uh, you were all able to use? Um, just yeah, more more about that. I'm interested to learn. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. And you know, I love political strategy, and it took a lot of it to get this project to go forward. Um, Portland for Everyone didn't exist um, in any form. And one of the strategies that we did was um, one that you seem to be doing too, is that we had a pro bill, pro housing bill going through at the same time as a pro renter bill. Um, and I see that companion bill there that happened at the city level and the state level. Um, it was really important to build a big tent alliance um, for Portland for Everyone. And that tent included, and this is where, I don't know what you're doing with your group, but um, it included not just sort of environmentalists, natural green space people, um, but also included the affordable housing nonprofits um, and included the um, transportation advocates. And the affordable housing group is the one that I think was really pivotal because we had a whole group of nonprofits, Habitat for Humanity, um, the Community Land Trust that had just been become entirely priced out of the neighborhoods they've been working in. And those groups were able to say, look, 
we can't, you saw that map earlier with all the yellow zoning. Basically, this is not even worth it for them looking for property in that area anymore. Just not worth it. And they were some of the strongest allies. And I know that in some communities, the affordable housing nonprofits are not part of the coalition. So you would know whether it's working there or not. Because um, frankly, some of the, the, their bread and butter is not this kind of project. They're doing low-income housing tax credit projects of 40 plus units. And why would they wade into the political fray of residential neighborhoods where some of their board members might live and might be against it? Um, it's, it's, a, it's not a slam dunk. I know in the Bay Area, the affordable housing groups are not necessarily on board um, with, with infill. Um, but that's part of the coalition. Um, and then after that got going, um, I became a member of the planning commission. I had to ex extract, extricate myself just for a conflict of interest. Um, but it's, um, I know it was, it was really important to be part of the anti-displacement coalition um, because a lot of folks, um, we need both, we need both. Protecting for renters um, who are getting displaced and, um, and making sure we have enough housing for everybody. And too often those are pit against each other. So to have those as part of the same package is really powerful. Absolutely, I think that was the thinking behind um, uh, when Council Member Jawando introduced the missing middle zoning amendment, he also introduced um, legislation around rent control. Um, and I think that that was the idea that, you know, it, it's not just one thing, uh, one doesn't preclude the other. Um, so that's super helpful to hear about that experience. And I was just talking today with the Montgomery Housing Alliance, which includes a lot of uh, nonprofit um, affordable housing developers. Habitat for Humanity was our, our big partner when pushing for accessory dwelling unit legislation because it had become so unaffordable for them to produce affordable units in Montgomery County uh, that they were interested in looking into accessory dwelling units. And now they're they're also very interested in the middle housing for for that reason exactly. I'll say one uh, more so, quick thing is that at yeah. each stage you got a lot of process to go through to get this adopted. I can tell. Um, at each stage, Portland for Everyone shifted the goalposts. Um, it, it, it wasn't what we saw at the beginning was a shadow of what we ended up with. Um, so it, it's it's something where continued engagement can work. And in, our, in your perspective, you can point to other parts of the country um, near and far that have gone way further than what you're contemplating. I mean, single family zoning doesn't exist in Oregon anymore. You know, it barely exists in California. Um, and, um, and initiatives are happening in you know, Maine, New Hampshire, even Nebraska almost passed the middle housing bill that would have required every city to, to do it. Um, so you're not out there um, pushing the envelope on this stuff. Although Montgomery County does like to 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 lead, to be uh, to be among the first, so hopefully hopefully we're hitting a sweet spot where we can be a leader and also follow some of these great examples. Um, I want to open up the conversation now and add the spotlight of Lisa to, to the conversation. We've had a lot of questions, so I'm sorry in advance to the participants that we very likely won't be able to get to all of them, but I do want to put in the chat. Um, another meeting that is happening um, that is being hosted by the Forest Estates Community Association. And that's a conversation with Council Member Will Chawando about the zoning changes that are proposed in ZTA, uh, oh man, 2007, yes, 2007. Um, and so you'll be able to ask really specific questions about that proposal then. Tonight, we wanted to focus on missing middle housing in general as a concept and talk about some of the um, challenges and opportunities that are, you know, for no matter what. Um, so I think we'll, we'll shy away from some of the specific questions about that. And I'll also say that Lisa very graciously offered her contact information. Um, so if, if you don't mind sharing that again in the chat, I'm sure you'll have plenty of people reaching out to you with questions. Uh, but that's another way to get your specific questions answered. Um, first, I wanted to ask a question from Anna about how does community and or developer opposition play into the barriers to increasing missing middle housing to make it non-missing, I guess. Is that one of the major challenges, challenges to, making, to making this type of housing feasible? I'm sorry, I think, I think yes, I think, I think uh, Eli said it great that the change is hard. And I think that we have a lot to do. And I think meetings like this go a long way of sharing educational materials of what missing middle is, 
what is feasible and explaining that your neighborhood's not going to change overnight. And I think that the more we do things like this and the more we normalize talking about things like this, I think will we'll be helpful in getting missing middle initiatives passed. Uh, let's see. So I want to, uh, one of the, the big questions that people normally have about any type of housing that is not single family housing or sometimes even new single family housing is parking. Uh, there's also a question, Eli, about what is tandem parking? And I have a question to Lisa about, are we already doing any of those smart things that Eli mentioned regarding parking in the zoning code? Eli, do you want to go? Uh, so, uh, Eli, you're on mute. Go ahead, Lisa, you know the layer of the land better than me. <laughs> sure. So in terms, I will say in the ZTA, there are reduced parking requirements for if you're in one half mile of Metro. Um, parking generally for new single family detached structures are attached structures. You do have a parking requirement, which is basically, I believe, um, two units, two parking spots per unit, which is a lot when you're dealing with transit accessible neighborhoods. We have done a lot to reduce the parking requirements in a lot of our multifamily developments in the CR zone. It just has not been extended to the missing middle type of housing. So we do have some work to do there. The trick side, the tandem parking is where you have a long driveway. You have one car has to get out to get the both in there. That's what that means. Um, I mean, these are tricks. These are ways of saying that you're, you're having a parking requirement, but you don't actually have it as strict as it seems. Um, and one of the, um, there's so many wonderful images of missing middle housing, you and you have examples in your community um, that were built before World War II. A lot of the times, the reason those worked is because there was not on-site parking. And we have examples of housing built at exactly the same residential density in the 70s, and it's an L-shaped building with a parking lot in the middle. It's not what people actually want to get built when they envision this lovely missing middle housing type. Um, so sometimes they, they run across purposes. Um, if you actually add up eight units and figure out how much space is going to take to surface park, 16 cars or eight cars, you may be forced with a site plan that looks nothing like one of these middle housing options. And so if, if, I'm if, if I'm understanding you correctly, Lisa, the current zoning code doesn't count tandem parking or street parking as towards the parking requirements. I think there's certain places in the county, and again, I'm not a regulatory reviewer, so I, this is something I can get back to you. There are certain places where off-street parking can be included, but most of the time, if you're adding a new unit, from my understanding, you do need to add two parking spots, which are usually going to be on site and not on, on the street. I think if you're adding a new street and you're building it in a new development, which we're not going to see down county, then you can count off-street parking, but not if you're not in places where the, the road infrastructure already exists. Great. Um, and I think to, to bounce off of one of the things that Eli said that these housing types already exist uh, in many places uh, across the United States, um, but including in the DC region, uh, a lot of it was just built usually before World War II. When I think of missing middle housing, I think of the triplex that I lived in in College Park um, that gave me an affordable place to live during grad school. Um, and looked, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was a, a triplex unless you saw the, I guess, the utility box on the side because there were three of them. Uh, but that was a great option. It was very close to Metro. I could bike to Metro in five minutes. Um, there are a lot of other small apartment buildings mixed with single family homes in the Old Town College Park area. I'm a huge College Park fan. So uh, <laughs> so uh, that's that's my favorite example. Um, what are, and I guess uh, East Silver Spring, we, one of our meetings uh, seems like ages ago now was a virtual walking tour of East Silver Spring uh, where there's a lot of small apartment buildings, triplexes that you would never guess are triplexes because they just look like a normal bungalow. Um, duplexes, things like that. A lot of them are very old though because they're not allowed to be built today. Uh, what are some other examples, Lisa, in the DC region of places that people on the call might know? Sure, so there's, so for Missing Middle, I think East Silver Spring and Tacoma Park are probably the most well-known places for Missing Middle, but we've seen examples of places like Chevy Chase, Bethesda, you know, Kentlands is a new uh, development that built Missing Middle type of housing. Um, I think those are, King Farm also has missing middle. They have you know, 
two over twos and stack flats. So I, I think that it's common, but I think like you said, that people don't realize it because they walk by and it looks like a regular single family home. Yeah, I think, I mean, Kentlands is such a famous example of a smart growth uh, or like the new urbanism, traditional community style of development. Um, I remember the first time that I went there, I was like, wow, I might be, I think that was a few years ago, I might be in my early 20s, but I'm ready to, to settle down and have my beautiful suburban dream home in Kentlands. It's such a beautiful place and so rare to, to see places like that built uh, to them. Um, one of the questions uh, was, was why near transit? Why is, why is it important to focus this growth um, along transit corridors? Um, would, would either of you be able to tackle that one? It's a 20 minute walk issue is like you want people to be able to, especially, um, I'm not sure how much to go into it, but it, you got such a huge public investment in your transit corridors. Um, it's so easy for people to get anywhere else once they get there. If you're in a walkable distance, then um, there's a certain absurdity that you, um, to have such a low density housing type there. Um, it's, it's, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a bill that almost passed in California saying that you can only, um, that they would automatically rezone around transit um, much higher density than they're right now. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a walkable um, standard and yeah, I think that's it. Right, because I, it's really a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lisa. No, I was gonna say, I, I agree with him. I think like Montgomery County is putting so much investment into the Purple Line, into the BRT, that I think it would, it's, we really need to think about increasing the density and in, in gentle ways in these in these corridors to really increase the, the ridership. And I think that's really important. And a lot of our central business districts are great employment centers. They might not be holding a lot of employees right now because of the pandemic, but we know that it'll, It'll come back one day and we want to increase access to these high opportunity neighborhoods that are near jobs and places. Exactly, I think you put it perfectly. One Sorry. reason we didn't worry about allowing um, missing middle housing options across almost the whole city is because the national, the economic, economics have worked much better at the transit stops. So that's where you see them anyway. So accessory drilling units are allowed anywhere in the city, but mostly they happen in the close in walkable neighborhoods. That's, that's naturally gonna happen. Yeah, and I think one thing we've been seeing a lot of Montgomery County is a lot of new development is townhomes, but a lot of that new development is very far up to 70 um, and not near major job centers. And so then we get the infamous awful traffic on I-270 and then we get very anti-climate plans from the governor to expand 270. Um, so I, I think that that's part of it. One of the things that we like to say at CSG is that housing in the right locations is a climate solution um, because you're going to be closer to transit. So you don't have to, you might still own a car, but you can take transit or walk or bike for certain trips. And if you do drive, it's a shorter drive. So you're reducing your vehicle miles traveled. Um, and then you're also, as Lisa said, closer to jobs, which is really important, closer to more schools, amenities, and even if these, uh, even if you know it's a uh, a duplex that's going for market rate, it's still comparatively cheaper to a new single-family home in the same neighborhood, and opens up a whole new world of opportunity for um, access to healthcare and transit and jobs and et cetera uh, that a family would have otherwise not had. So that's that's one of the that's the the long answer to to why near transit. Um, question this uh, I think this this will work for both of you but Eli since I know that you've developed housing in the past uh, what changes to financing do you think would encourage the construction of more middle housing um, I've worked more on this with the accessory dwelling in sort of the lowest end of middle housing spectrum where they're starting to get better financing options out there um, I I don't honestly have a great answer I think that the the good thing is that from Fannie and Freddie's perspective, the GSEs um, that make most of the loans or buy most of the loans, um, one to four units is the same. Um, so to get up to the four unit point, um, you're, you're in good shape and there's great owner occupied financing for up to four units. And there's, and there's already, especially on the East Coast, less so out here, you've got the existing model of the, the row house with one unit on the ground and two units above it rented out. Um, and it's all over Philadelphia and Boston and, and I'm sure in your areas too. Um, so your that your financing is already covered in that spot, um, but as you get the larger, once you get above four units, then it, it gets harder. Um, so I guess I don't have a great answer, but hopefully 
finance will, will follow. Um, but that is one reason to allow them to be subdivided um, because then you get traditional single family um, financing. Um, you can do that with a condo or, or a townhouse, but it's easier with a, with a townhouse. Very interesting. Um, and we're, oh my gosh, already nearing 8.15. So I'll try to squeeze in a few more questions. Um, there is a question about what is what is the benefit to single family homeowners? There's obviously a benefit to people who want to be able to live in a community that they're currently not able to, to get into because there's not enough housing uh, on the market there. Um, and this would be good for the environment and a lot of other things. But if you're an uh, existing single family uh, homeowner in a neighborhood, what, what is the benefit to, um, to having more duplexes, triplexes, et cetera? I think one of the big things that we have tried to establish in Thrive 25 is that new housing in general, new neighbors are a benefit to Montgomery County. We're increasing our economic base. You are living in now, you know, probably more diverse neighborhoods by allowing more neighbors. You, I think that we in Montgomery County have sometimes tended to look at housing as a burden instead of understanding that like new housing and residents are you know, a net benefit. And so I think that, you know, there's a lot to be said about the benefits of missing middle housing in, in your neighborhood that I think, you know, we should start looking at it that way instead of just what, how does this hurt single family homeowners? How does this help single family neighbors? How does, you know, increase their diversity and increase the access to new, new friends? Yeah. Our, our local group, Portland for Everyone, was renamed Portland Neighbors Welcome. Um, you know, it takes a certain critical mass of people to support local walkable retail too. If you just have a whole string of Single family homes, um, the, you can't have walkable retail. You just need a bigger population density. I know that that's been a big conversation in the forest, the area around the Forest Glen neighborhood, because a lot of the uh, single family homeowners there, they want to be able to walk to coffee shops and neighborhood retail and, you know, go, to, go out to a restaurant instead of having to go down to downtown Silver Spring to do those things since they have a metro station right there in their neighborhood. Um, and so that was a big impetus uh, to the recent Forest Glen master plan to adding some uh, uh, more dense housing types around the metro station there. Uh, so that they can have those types of amenities that you don't really get if you don't have enough people. Uh, so yes, shout out to Allison. <laughs> She's in the chat going woot woot for us, Glenn. Um, one minute to 8.15. Um, let's see. I want to, I, I don't know what to, what to end on. <laughs> uh, let's see. There's a question about uh, Portland. So while I have you here, Eli, how much open space is required on lots in Portland? I guess the lot coverage ratios. Yeah, uh, just, and how, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. And how do those play into what you can build? Um, it, we have a 50% lot coverage in these in most of these zones. Um, and it was really important in passing this law that we didn't in, we didn't um, allow higher lot coverage. Because if we did, then we'd be butting heads with the environmentalists and the tree preservation folks. So we, we kept it where it was. You, you have a much lower percentage allowed. So I, I would think maybe you could go up, but that's your call. <laughs> Yours is currently 30%, Lisa, is that correct? It depends on the zone, but generally 30%, yes, in R60. And I know that in with large scale redevelopment like Pike and Rose and White Flint, that redevelopment really helped to upgrade stormwater management standards um, because before it was just a giant paved surface lot. Um, and so the redevelopment allowed them to make some of those really massive stormwater upgrades. Is the same true for redeveloping some of these much older single family lots? So we haven't seen a lot of missing middle, obviously in Montgomery County, but I, I will say, you know, that that is something, obviously when you redevelop something, you're going to look to make sure that that product is sustainable. Um, so you, you're gonna see, you know, new trees, hopefully, I understand that uh, the tree canopy has been a big discussion in, in terms of the ZTA, and I think that you know that's something that will will come up. Um, but I, I, that's a hard question. But I do think that um, when you redevelop in something, you're obviously looking for ways to increase tree canopy and um, stormwater if possible. Right, because a lot of you know a lot of these. Uh, homes were, were built before we had 
uh, our 21st century stormwater standards. And so I'd imagine that similar to those large scale redevelopments that this gives them an opportunity to make sure that they're up to date on complying with our, our more modern climate change focused uh, stormwater requirements. Uh, so, so we're a little bit past 8.15. Any closing thoughts or closing words from, from either of you? Things that we didn't get to hit on that you wanna make sure that we touch on. I would just say, I, I think Eli, you know, did a great job of speaking like the importance of advocacy groups like this. I think, you know, working at the planning department for the past five years, you hear a lot of people that are, you know, scared of change, but I think groups like this do a long way of like normalizing, um, you know, the evolution of these neighborhoods. So I, I thank you guys for all of your work that you do. Well, I'm gonna pick up on that same thought. I got started when a staffer in the mayor's office said, we're gonna try and do some aggressive zoning reform. We need this group to exist to have our back when it comes to the planning commission and the city council. And that was my reminder that we had to create an outside of government group to apply the pressure and we, and we did. Um, and so I, I think that Lisa and the people who are gonna be um, making decisions on this down the road are gonna need to hear from the group. And, um, and that, that's, how, that's how this stuff gets done. So in, in, in your neighborhood associations, that's, that's one of those cases where we had 27 neighborhood associations against it. We had six in favor of it. You know, we could say there's some going each way. I mean, you're not gonna win over every group, but it's nice to have a little bit um, of support from even the, the local neighbor, neighbor groups that might not tend to like any change. Absolutely. Well, thank you both again for your presentations. Those were wonderful. Um, and of course, this is only the tip of the iceberg, uh, but I wanna, before we close out, talk about what's next. Um, so next steps for Thrive 2050 is the spring public hearing before the county council. We had some amazing turnout for the uh, November public hearing before the planning board. And so we're gonna do that again, do it even more uh, for the county council hearing. And then next for Montgomery for All, uh, we typically meet on the second Thursday of the month and that perfectly aligns with uh, when the public hearing for the missing middle zoning amendment is February, the evening of February 11th. So uh, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, unfortunately, the, um, the speakers list has filled up for that, but you can still make your voice heard by submitting written testimony. We're not looking for you to get super technical about what you think setbacks should be or parking requirements necessarily, but I think it's really important for community members uh, to share their housing stories, to talk about the either the difficulty of finding housing that is attainable for your income in Montgomery County. You know, that's part of my housing story. Um, whether, uh, you know, you've lived here for a long time and, you know, you're, you've had kids and they can't move back to the county because it's so unaffordable and there aren't enough housing options. So everybody has a little bit of a different story. And I think that this is a perfect opportunity to share yours. So um, we have a Montgomery for All Slack. Uh, and we sort of did this uh, uh, impromptu for the planning board public hearing. We had a little watch party. Uh, so I think we'll probably do that again since a lot of us weren't able to get onto the speakers list. I'll be speaking, but <laughs> um, not everybody else who wanted to will be able to. Uh, so we can cheer on the people who, the people who are able to speak. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in submitting written testimony, reach out to me. I should have put my email on this, uh, jane at smartergrowth.net. Um, it's also on our website. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I have some materials that I'm happy to share with you to figure out um, or to help you figure out what you would like to say in your testimony. So with that, uh, thank you again to our speakers. Thank you to everybody for coming and participating. If you enjoyed this and want to share this with your friends and neighbors, we'll be uploading it to Montgomery for All's YouTube channel uh, by tomorrow morning. So you'll be able to share the link uh, with all of your friends and neighbors. So please have a wonderful rest of your week uh, and let's hope for some snow on Sunday. Take care, everyone. <laughs>